Sorry, a Dimitri now is the Vitanostra. She would have known Dimitri was the Vitor of Nostri, but my notion be present and explaining for you the honor of my mother. Paternal copy of Michelle is sent to Peter Manon to him, and then he arranged to him the ever in the store. She put in cello at in terror. Panem Nostrum quotidianum done of Isodio. Dimitri Novis de Vita Nostra. She could have known Dimitri. She could have known Dimitri was the Vita of his Nostri. But men of Indukas in Tentazione said Livera Nostra Male. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus Tecum. Benedicta tu in Mulieribus. Et Benedictus tu in Tentazione tu in Iesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus. Nunc et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Iesus. How about now? I'm speaking directly to the microphone. So I'm actually gonna hold it. And I'm holding right now. Can you hear me? I can't even hear my cell phone though. I think. Okay, you can hear. So should I tell them uh, to hold the microphone with their hand while talking? And so, and so they can share it whenever they are, uh, yeah, hold and speak, okay. So should I tell them that? Or, because I mean, we only have one mic for them. How should we, how should we do it? Yeah, okay. So yeah, they, they should hold it then. Uh, and I guess in case they want to rest, they can just put it in the stand. Uh, no, um, okay.
Ok, giusto, ok. Pater Noster, qui es in cieli, sanctificetur nomen tuum, advenia regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cielo ed in terra. Panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie, et dimite nobis de vita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus de vitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos a malo. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tui mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Iesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Amen. Ok, you tell me one stop, ok? I'll just keep going. Um, Padre nuestro que estás en el cielo, santificado sea tu nombre. Venga a nosotros tu reino, hágase tu voluntad en la tierra como en el cielo. Ah, interesante, a veces me escucho. Sometimes I hear myself in the headphones and sometimes I don't. Uh, Pater Noster, qui es in cieli, sanctificetur nomen tuum. Advenia regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cielo in terra. Panem nostrum, quotidianum da nobis odie, dimite nobis de vita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus de vitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos a malo. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Ok, good. Sounds good. Ok, I'll, I'll come back.
Welcome to the Solemn Pontifical Mass with ordination to the Holy Priesthood on this day of St. Bede the Venerable, the 27th of May in 2022. The celebrant today will be His Excellency, the Most Reverend Thomas Gullickson, titular Archbishop of Polymartium, who will be ordaining seven men for the priestly paternity of St. Peter. Reverend Mr. Cidrian Cortez from Mililani, Hawaii. Reverend Mr. Noel Armando Suarez from Vasco de Gama, Goa, India. Reverend Mr. David Lopez of San Diego, California. Reverend Mr. David Ramirez and his brother Edgar Ramirez from El Paso, Texas. Mr. Ken Greeley from Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. And Mr. Isaac Diaz Mendoza. <laughs> communities who are used to low mass every day, maybe an occasional high mass, or maybe a very rare solemn high mass. It's in the pontifical solemn high mass, the mass that we see today, that the full glory and expression and beauty of the traditional liturgy is shown forth. In this liturgy with the bishop, in union with the bishop, but also with all of his ministers, all of his priests, his archdeacons, his deacons and subdeacons, all of his clergy offering the sacrifice in union with the bishop. Again, the Mass for today will be that of St. Bede the Venerable. Now the bishop begins the prayers at the foot of the altar. The scholar begins the introit, taken from the Book of Wisdom, and in the midst of the church he shall open his mouth, and shall fill him with the spirit of wisdom and understanding, and shall clothe him with a robe of glory. Alleluia, alleluia. It is good to give praise to the Lord and to sing to thy name, O Most High. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And in the midst of the church he shall open his mouth and shall fill him with the spirit of wisdom and understanding, and shall clothe him with a robe of glory. Alleluia, alleluia. We know 
that the celebrant begins at the foot of the altar, confessing his unworthiness to ascend into the holy place, the presence of God, without having first made confession of his sins and having received pardon from God. steps on the way to ordination to the priesthood at a man's tonsure, a man's minor orders, at the subdiaconate and at the diaconate, all of those ordinations are inserted into a pontifical mass such as the one today. Each of those ordinations are a little bit later in the ceremony. So for instance, the minor orders are at the very beginning of mass, the subdeacons are ordained right before the epistle, and the deacons are ordained right before the gospel. But the priest that we see ordained today will be ordained right in the middle of this solemn pontifical mass. And not only will they be ordained by the bishop, but then they will offer their first mass in union with him in the second half of this mass, in the offertory and in the canon of the mass. The bishop imposes incense, which of course signifies our prayers rising up to God. The value of our prayers, the efficacy being caused by the ardor of our charity, represented by the burning coal. the altar of sacrifice incensed where we will offer that sweet sacrifice of praise to our Lord but also the celebrant and the sacred ministers as St. Paul tells us that we are to be the good odor of Christ by our good deeds. Kyrie is now sung by the Skola. Kyrie, of course, is Greek for Lord have mercy and reminds us of the most ancient origins of our Christian faith, which came from the East to Rome, when Greek was still the Christian-speaking language, the language of the educated people. It is sung three times, three times, three, indicating, according to some commentators, that we ask, we ask for mercy for all the nine choirs of angels which have fallen, uh, from the angels which have fallen from those nine choirs, which we are called to replace by sanctifying grace. The Greek words Kyrie eleison are also significant, as in this Mass, the, the Latin Mass, we have three languages. There's Latin, predominantly, also Greek, 
and also Hebrew. We have words like Amen and Alleluia. And as St. John in his Gospel tells us, these are the three languages which were written above the cross, above Christ's head, at the crucifixion. And so at the Mass as we ascend Calvary once again, even the very languages and the liturgical languages that we use mirror that place of Calvary. The first words of the Gloria, Gloria in excelsis Deo, or Glory to God in the Highest. These words are taken from St. Matthew's Gospel, and they are the words of the angel announcing the birth of our Lord. Now the Gloria, the hymn of the Gloria as it exists today in the Mass is slightly longer and it's elongated, and the Church has added certain expressions of praise and glori glorifying God and has added those expressions to the words of the angel. And so here in the liturgy, we have that meeting of heaven and earth of both angelic praise of God and also the church lending her voice to that angelic praise. St. Robert Bellarmine comments that almost all agree that Pope St. Telesphorus, who was martyred in the year 136, was the, the first who laid down that this be sung at Mass. So again, we are witnessing today the ancient Roman rite and all of the most ancient ceremonies which come to us, ultimately from the Apostles. The bishop now greets the people with the words, Pax Vobis, peace be with you. Instead of asking that the Lord be with you, the bishop, of course, represents Christ, the high priest, in our midst, who announces peace, as did the risen Christ, to his disciples. And he prays, O God, who enlightened your church with the learning of Blessed Bede, your confessor and doctor, graciously grant that your servants may ever be enlightened by his wisdom and helped by his merits. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, thy Son, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, world without end. Amen.
Now the epistle is sung by the subdeacon. We note that as we see in the architecture of one of the most ancient churches of Christendom, in the excavations of St. Clement of Rome, that the epistle was sung from ancient times facing the east as well. In ancient times consisting often of a prophecy from the Old Testament, it points towards Christ. So that even the singing of the lesson is an act of worship towards God, directing our minds towards Him. And the lesson we have today is from the prophet Joel. Or rather from St. Paul to St. Timothy. Dearly beloved, I charge thee before God and Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead by his coming and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, entreat, rebuke in all patience and doctrine. For there shall be a time when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and will indeed turn away their hearing from the truth, but we be turned in unto fables. But be thou vigilant, labor in all things, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill thy ministry, be sober, for I am even now ready to be sacrificed, and the time of my dissolution is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. As to the rest, there is laid up for me a crown of justice, which the Lord, the just judge, will render to me in that day, and not only to me, but to them also that love his coming. To which we respond, thanks be to God. The subdeacon now comes and receives a blessing. We note, according to commentators, too, that he represents the synagogue, the Old Testament, which was not sent here by Christ, the high priest, but which approaches him after having announced in prophecy the instructions for our salvation. St. Thomas Aquinas comments that at this point in the Mass, of course, there is read usually the gradual and the Alleluia. He says, after the reading from the prophets or the apostles, the choir sings the gradual, referring to steps, which signifies progress in life as we grow closer to Christ through our study of the faith. He says, then, an Alleluia is sung to signify spiritual gladness, as this will represent that Christ will now speak to us through the deacon sent by the church to announce the good news. St. Gregory the Great comments that our custom of saying the Alleluia is said to be derived from the Church of Jerusalem by the tradition of the Blessed Jerome in the time of Pope Damasus, a blessed memory. 
Alleluia, St. Bede, the Venerable, whose feast day is today, comments, it is a Hebrew word and it means praise our Lord. He says, it is most proper and beautiful that a general custom has prevailed in Holy Church of all the faithful throughout the world, singing this word of praise in the Hebrew language. In this way, the whole church is admonished that it ought now to consist in one faith, confession, and love of Christ. And then in the future, it ought to hurry to that fatherland in which there is no discord or of minds and no disharmony of peace and speech. Bishop Conley has dispensed you from the recitation of the breviary. The rector thought that you would accept this notice with the due humility and thankfulness which goes with it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. In Medio Ecclesiae, in the midst of the church, he opened his mouth, and the Lord filled him with the spirit of wisdom and understanding. He clothed him with a robe of glory. St. Bede the Venerable, pray for us. The only other time in my life when I have ordained priests was at your sister seminary in Vigratzbad, Germany. For the life of me, nothing of what I said by way of an exhortation on that occasion has stuck with me. I do remember quite vividly the liturgy of ordination itself. So today, too, rather than push my luck grasping for high-flown words, I want to invite you to let the gestures and signs which embellish this great sacrament simply take hold of you and be a grace for you on this your ordination day. May this sacred action be a renewing grace for all of the older priests privileged to be present here today. May all of your younger confreres from Our Lady of Guadalupe Seminary be strengthened in their faith and in the resolve to seek the will of the Lord who calls men to his service. May all of the faithful here present take heart and take courage at the beginning of this Pentecost Novena. Dear Lord, we pray that through the conferral of the Sacrament of Holy Orders, we may witness the Church renewed by this outpouring of grace. As I say, let us let the liturgy speak to us today and teach us about priesthood, and permit me, for all here present, to pose another sideline of questioning which is intimately bound up with this mystery. To do so somehow seems more important and urgent than it was in times long past. And so the big question, where do vocations come from? How do they develop? What can we do to nurture vocations, especially to call forth and strengthen the vocations to the priesthood which Christ surely gives in abundance to his church. While we all have a part to play, I firmly believe that nurturing vocations to the priesthood is a work of the church which wells up from the very heart of Christ. In saying that, I want to contradict much of the common wisdom which often blames the present vocation crisis on corruption in the hierarchy, on the novus ordo and liturgical abuse, on dis the disappearance of the traditional family, on the failures of our educational system, and onward we go. As much as any or all of these things may be factors, what has preserved you men to this day and brought you here before the altar of God is the loving heart of Christ answering prayer, answering your prayer, the prayers of family and friends, the prayer of the church. O Lord, grant that I may become a priest after thine own heart. That was my prayer from a rather young age. How young? I couldn't tell you how old I might have been, maybe 10 years old, maybe 12. My family at that time lived in Moorhead, Minnesota, and my dad took me over to a vocations fair at Chanley High School in Fargo, North Dakota. For those couple days of the fair, 
our next door neighbors had staying at their house a priest cousin of theirs, the vocation director of the Crozier Fathers, and a friend of his, the vocation director of the Palatine Fathers. From meeting them at the neighbor's house and making the rounds of all the booths of the different religious orders there at the fair, what struck me, what stuck with me, and what I treasured from then on was a bookmark size prayer card I got from the Crozier Father. It had on it the words, O Lord, grant that I may become a priest after thine own heart. I would say that prayer kneeling by my bed at night. In high school seminary, I tacked it on my little bulletin board over my study desk. That simple prayer still wells up from deep within me at nearly 72 years of age, as, I w as if I were still that little boy. In a sense, ordination day is a point of, re of arrival, but not really. The supplication on your part for the divine assistance must continue always and until death, unflagging and without ceasing. O Lord, grant that I may become a priest after thine own heart. Let the action of Christ wash over you today, or in case of all of the rest of us here today with you, join me in beseeching the Lord to claim these men for his own heart today. May they and we become ever more worthy sons of so great a mother. In the midst of the church, he opened his mouth, and the Lord filled him with the spirit of wisdom and understanding. He clothed him with a robe of glory. What kind of saintly priests are we looking at here before us? Martyrs? Confessors of the faith? Doctors of the church like Venerable Bede? Let the good work begun in the heart of each one by the prayers and sacrifices of many be brought to completion but simply and honestly pray on, and because of the grace of this sacrament, pray on with renewed vigor and full confidence. O Lord, grant that I may become a priest after thine own heart. Praised be Jesus Christ. Our Lady of Guadalupe, watch over your sons and pray for us. St. Bede, the Venerable, pray for us. The assistant priest will now call forth the deacons to be ordained, saying, Let those to be ordained approach. He reads the following, The Most Reverend Father in Christ, His Lordship, Bishop Kolitsin, by the grace of God and the favor of the Apostolic See, orders and commands under penalty of excommunication, all and each here present for receiving orders, that none of those who may perchance be irregular or excommunicated by the canons or by his superior 
or under interdict or suspended, illegitimate, infamous, or otherwise excluded by the canons, or who may be from another diocese by birth, and lacks the permission of his bishop, and none of those who has not been registered, examined, approved, and called by name shall, on any account, dare to come forward to receive orders. He commands also that none of those ordained shall leave until Mass is ended, and they have received the Episcopal benediction. Let all who are to be ordained to the priesthood approach. And as their names are read, they respond, Ad Sum, meaning I am present. Like the prophet Samuel who said, Here I am, Lord, ready to do thy will. Again, we note in the words of the assistant priest, and again, no one can take this office on to himself, but unless he is called by the church and sent by him, the church is one in her apostolic authority. He presents the candidates to the bishop, saying, Most Reverend Father, our Holy Mother of the Catholic Church, praise that thou wouldst ordain these deacons here present to the office of the priesthood. The bishop asks, Dost thou know them to be worthy? So far as human frailty allows me to know, I do both know and attest that they are worthy of the burden of this office. Thanks be to God. He then addresses the clergy and people as follows. Dearly beloved brethren, as all on a ship, both the captain and the passengers, have the same reasons for confidence or for fear, they should act together with one mind, seeing that their interests are the same. The fathers therefore decreed with reason that the people should be consulted in the election of those who are to minister at the altar. Even should their life and conduct be unknown to the greater number, they may be known to some, and all will necessarily yield a more ready obedience to a priest to whose ordination they have signified their assent. Now the conduct of these deacons whom, by God's help, we are about to ordain priests, is, as far as we can tell, exemplary, pleasing to God, and deserving, in our opinion, of a higher ecclesiastical dignity. But as the judgment of one person, or even of several, may be affected and misled by favor or partiality, it is well to ascertain the general opinion. Wherefore, set forth freely what you may know of the actions or behavior of these men, and what you think of their worth. And I testify to their fitness for the priesthood on account of their deserts, rather than from any partiality to them. If then anyone has aught to their prejudice, for God's sake and in God's name, let him boldly come forward and speak. Nevertheless, let him be mindful of his own condition. Consecrandi fili e dilettissimi in presbiterati sufficium, illud digne suscitere ac susceptum laudat. With no objections, he then continues. Dearly beloved sons, as you are now about to be consecrated to the office of the priesthood, endeavor to receive it worthily, and when you have received it, fulfill its duties blamelessly. The priest is ordained to offer sacrifice, to bless, guide, preach, and baptize. With great awe, then, should one advance to so high a state, and care must be taken that they who are chosen should be commended for their heavenly wisdom, their blameless life, and their persevering practice of virtue. Thus, when the Lord commanded Moses to choose seventy men of all Israel to be his helpers, to whom he would impart the gifts of the Holy Ghost, he added, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people. 
you indeed are foreshadowed by these seventy men and elders. If through the sevenfold spirit you keep the Ten Commandments of the law and show yourselves blameless and mature, both in your knowledge and in your work, the same mystical meaning and the same type are found in the New Testament when the Lord chose the seventy-two and sent them forth in pairs to preach before him, thus teaching both by word and deed that the ministers of his church should be perfect in faith and action, that is, well grounded in the virtue of the twofold love of God and neighbor. Strive then to be such as may rightly be chosen by God's grace to assist Moses and the twelve apostles, that is, the Catholic bishops who are represented by Moses and the apostles. For, indeed, Holy Church is served, adorned, and governed by an admirable variety of ministers, first the bishops, under them the priests, then the deacons and the subdeacons, each consecrated in his own degree, and all these members, though differing in dignity, forming one body of Christ. Wherefore, dearly beloved sons, whom the voice of our brethren has chosen, that you may be consecrated as our helpers, let your conduct at all times be the outcome of a chaste and holy life. Consider what you do, imitate that which you handle, and as you celebrate the mysteries of the Lord's death, be earnest in, riddling, in ridding your members by mortification of all vices and lusts. Let your teaching be a spiritual remedy for God's people. Let the fragrance of your lives be a delight to the Church of God, that by both your preaching and example you may build up the house, that is, the family of God, so that neither we may deserve to be condemned by the Lord for promoting you to so sublime an office, nor you for taking it upon yourselves, but rather that he may reward us all. May he of his grace grant us this. Amen. In this exhortation, the bishop explains to the deacons about to be ordained priests what their duties are and what their duties will be as priests. And there are five duties listed in, in this exhortation. The first and foremost of them is to offer sacrifice, sacrificare. The greatest dignity and the greatest duty of a priest is to offer sacrifice, to offer the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And it's so important that for the remainder of this Mass, after ordination, the bishop will teach the ordinati how to say their first Mass. The second duty is to bless. And these priests, these newly ordained priests, will go out and bless people, they will bless places, and they will bless things. They will bless people in anointings of the sick and in their daily ministry uh, of their priesthood. Their third duty is to guide, pre esse, which means not only to guide, but to rule, to shepherd. They will have spiritual authority that they will have a duty and an obligation to use to build up the Church of God. Their fourth duty is to preach, to predicare, and to preach the Word of God by all, in all their actions, but also from the pulpit, from, by their words, by their exhortations. And we hope that these priests as well will be a preaching by their good example and by their holy life. And finally, their final duty, their fifth duty, is to baptize, to administer, first of all, the sacrament of baptism, but also all of the other sacraments, confession, communion, anointing of the sick, and marriages. symbol of their prostration as they offer themselves entirely to our Lord, depending on his grace and the grace which comes through the intercession of his saints.
This gesture of prostration or falling down before the altar of God is an ancient and biblical symbol of humility. The, just as the bishop began Mass with the Confidior, bowing down and confessing his sins before God before he dared to approach the altar, so too the Ordinati, just after answering the call of God, answering the sublime calling in the person of the bishop who called out, calls out their name, they take a step forward and their first act after responding to this call is to lie down prostrate, to fall down before God in thanksgiving, but also in humility, recognizing the great weight of their office, the great dignity to which God has called them.
sanctify these chosen men. We beseech thee, hear us. That thou bless, sanctify, and consecrate these chosen men, we beseech thee, hear us. As the litany now finishes, the bishop will in turn lay his hands on each candidate. We see the laying on of hands even from the Old Testament, how the patriarchs transmitted the blessing upon their, upon their heirs. Likewise in the New Testament, our Lord works so many miracles by the laying on of hands. And then we see it clearly throughout the Acts of the Apostles in the early church, how they chose seven men, for example, to ordain them deacons laying hands upon them. Likewise, then St. Paul exhorts St. Timothy that he be faithful to the grace that he has received through the gift of prophecy by, by the laying on the hands of the presbyters, of the priesthood. And so we will see this uh, matter, uh, this forms the matter of the sacrament. It is the laying on of hands. It was one hand for the deacons. It will now be two hands for the priests, and the clergy will likewise come and join the bishop in this in this act of laying hands upon those to be ordained. The laying on of hands is a, a very rich symbol in the Old Testament, both for the transferal of power and authority, but also to signify a victim. We know that Abraham laid his hands over Isaac as he offered the sacrifice of Isaac upon Mount Moriah. So to these priests, as Fulton Sheen will say, the priest is not his own, and the priest lives in union with the victim that he offers every day of his life. So too, these priests, when they have hands laid upon them, are marked as victims and one with the victim, the sacrificial victim of Jesus Christ.
Hearken to us, we beseech thee, O Lord our God, and pour down on these thy servants the blessing of the Holy Ghost and the power of priestly grace, that they whom we now present to thy loving kindness for consecration may ever enjoy the unfailing abundance of thy favor. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, thy Son, who lives and reigns with thee in the unity of the same Holy Ghost, world without end. Amen. with the consecratory preface. It is truly right and just, fitting and profitable that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to thee, Holy Lord, Father Almighty, everlasting God, the fountain of all honors and the bestower of every dignity, by whom all things make progress, by whom all things are strengthened, in accord with whose wise plan thy rational creatures are gradually drawn to a higher excellence. Thus the priestly grade and the office of the Levites, types of what was to follow, were fraught with a fuller significance when to the high priest first chosen by thee to govern thy people, thou didst give men of lesser degree and of subordinate rank as their associates and helpers. Thus in the wilderness didst thou infuse the spirit of Moses into the minds of the seventy wise men, whose help enabled him to govern without difficulty the countless multitude of thy people. Thus, too, didst thou pour into Eleazar and Ithamar, the sons of Aaron, the superabundant graces bestowed on their father, that the number of priests might be found sufficient for the celebration of the sacrifices and other sacred rites. In the same manner, O Lord, didst thou associate with the apostles of thy son other teachers of the faith by whom their words were spread throughout the whole world. Wherefore, we beseech thee, O Lord, bestow the like help on our own weakness, who need it the more as our frailty is so much the greater. Mm -hmm. 
Father, to these thy servants the dignity of the priesthood. Renew within them the spirit of holiness, that they may keep the rank in thy service which they have received from thee, and by their conduct may afford a pattern of holy living. We see in the very essence of the form of this sacrament, that again the term priesthood in Latin sacerdos, meaning uh, he who gives holy things us having been made holy himself yes as the bishop asked it to be renewed within them the spirit of holiness the deacon stole is now transformed into the priest stole as he prays take thou the yoke of the Lord for his yoke is sweet and his burden light Stole signifying the yoke of the Lord. And next he vests each one with a chasuble, which remains folded at the back, saying, Take thou the priestly vestment, whereby charity is signified. For God is well able to give thee an increase of charity and its perfect works. And the ordained replies, Thanks be to God. The chasuble of course is a term uh, which means little house you can see in it uh, sim symbolized the mystical body of Christ the house of God the church you see it is now folded until later in this ceremony they will receive the power to forgive sins and thus their power to sanctify the mystical body of Christ through hearing confessions will be extended as the chasuble will then be unfolded The stole is one of those priestly vestments that predates even Christianity. We see that in the Old Testament, the Levites and the Levitical priests wore a stole as a signal and sign of their office, their power to, to offer sacrifice in the name of the Lord. 
the stole also represents that primordial purity and that primordial innocence which Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden. And every time the priest places the stole over his breast, saying, saying before he is about to say Mass, he hearkens back to Adam and Eve and asking that God restore that innocence to him. Chasuble is a vestment that takes its origin from ancient Rome in the days of the catacombs in the first centuries AD. A chasuble was a travel garment that was worn over a toga or a, tu uh, a tunicle that would be worn in the daily life of a Roman. Later on, this became in the catacombs and later after the ages of the catacombs became a uniquely priestly vestment symbolizing charity and also the office and duties of the priesthood. Some of the words from the exhortation that ring true for many priests are those words, imitate what you handle. Often as priests are being vested in the stole, the priestly stole and the chasuble, they're thinking of those words, imitate what you handle. It's the great dignity of a priest to be able to handle the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ every day upon the altar. And as we now see these priests invested in the symbols and the vestments of their office. They are no doubt thinking about those words of the bishop, imitate what you handle.
Now rising, the bishop prays, O God, the source of all holiness, of whom are true consecration and the fullness of blessing, pour down, O Lord, on these thy servants, whom we now call to the honor of the priesthood, the grace of thy blessing, that by the gravity of their actions and the example of their lives, they may show themselves to be elders formed by the rule that Paul gave to Titus and Timothy, that meditating on thy law day and night, they may believe what they read, teach what they believe, conform to what they teach, giving proof in themselves and setting an example of justice, steadfastness, mercy, fortitude, as well as all the other virtues and by their admonition confirm others in the same, keeping the gift of their ministry pure and undefiled. May their holy blessing change for the service of thy people, bread and wine, into the body and blood of thy Son. And having attained through persevering charity unto mature manhood, and in old age received the fullness of Christ, may they rise again on the day of the just and everlasting judgment of God, with a good conscience, faith unfeigned, and imbued with the Holy Ghost. Through the same Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, world without end. Amen. In te convivere regnati unitati e unito in Spirito Santo Dei, per ogni arte e classe con l'uomo. Amen. Spiritus, asking that the Holy Ghost come and fill them with his sevenfold gifts. Berger says that this hymn, Veni Creator Spiritus, possibly comes from the Emperor Charlemagne, if not from his own hand, certainly from his reign and the epoch in which he existed. And this beautiful hymn has been used ever since the 9th or 10th century to express a longing for the gifts, the sevenfold gifts of the Holy Ghost. all the context as now we are in Ascension Tide, so being the Friday after Ascension Thursday of how the Apostles were waiting to receive the Holy Ghost so that they could be fit ministers. As we recall that they, have, they receive a participation in our Lord's own ministry. When Protestants, for example, are scandalized at how is it that the priest forgives sins, only God can forgive sins, we recall that our Lord said to them after his resurrection, as the Father sent me, so I send you. Receive the Holy Ghost. And so as they received that Holy Ghost at Pentecost, they were able to go out and be Christ to the world. Christ, of course, is a, is a Greek term, translating uh, the Hebrew Messiah, which means anointed one, one who was anointed with oils. And so now at this point in the ceremony, the bishop consecrates the hands of the priest. It's consecrating, setting them aside, making them holy to touch that which is holy, namely the body and blood of our Lord in the most sacred Eucharist. And so he anoints their hands in the form of a cross. So the cross is a sign of blessing as we preach Christ crucified and that the priest must be in particularly uh, conformed to Christ crucified in his words and in his actions. And that with these uh, hands in his ministry then he will 
go about to bless. And so the bishop, as he consecrates their hands with the sacred oils in the form of a cross, he prays, Be pleased, O Lord, to consecrate and hallow these hands by this anointing and our blessing. Amen. That whatsoever they bless may be blessed, and whatsoever they consecrate may be consecrated and hallowed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. see that after the bishop consecrates, anoints, and blesses the hands of the newly ordained priest, he wraps them in a white linen garment. This linen garment is called the manoturgium, it's a Latin term meaning the towel, a hand washing towel, and this towel, this linen garment is kept traditionally by the mother of the priest. There is a beautiful tradition that when the mother of a priest passes away, that the priest's son places the manoturgium in her coffin so that when she goes to the judgment seat of God, she can take the manoturgium and say, I bore you a priest of God. I'm sure all the mothers present today were very happy to hear that commentary, as well as especially the mother of the Ramirez brothers who will receive two of these uh, white linen cloths. From here arises as well, that again, this is why the traditional praxis is that only the priest uh, touches the Blessed Sacrament and uh, his hands consecrated for that purpose. It's likewise why you will see the liturgical gesture, too, of kissing the priest's hands. Whenever the acolyte gives him something, the priest extends his sacred hand and is kissed. My first assignment in Guadalajara, Mexico, I uh, there noted that the pious faithful generally kissed the, priest, uh, the hands of the priest uh, when they greeted him. Again, a, a very always being conscious of that dignity that the priest has received and a reminder to the priest of the holiness of his office. that there are three sacraments that confer an indelible mark upon the soul. The first one is baptism, whereby the soul is marked as a Christian. The second is confirmation, whereby one becomes a soldier of Christ. And the th third sacrament is the one that we see today in the sacred priesthood. And these men have received an indelible mark on their souls, whereby they are priests forever. And that's why we say, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And the oil with which their hands are consecrated symbolizes that eternal, permanent mark, that indelible mark, with which each of these young men has been marked today.
be noted that then the linen cloth is tied around their hands, again a symbol of their service to our Lord that they are forever bound in his service. The bishop will now present to each priest, newly ordained priest, a chalice containing wine and water with a paten and an unconsecrated host upon it. He holds it between four and middle fingers so as to touch both the paten and the cup of the chalice. This is very symbolic of the what the priest is now to dedicate himself to, namely to offering the sacrifice of the Mass. It was thought at one point that this was the part of the matter of the sacrament, but does not go back to apostolic times. It was considered as part of the matter of the sacrament, as it signifies for what the priest has been ordained. As St. Paul says uh, to the Hebrews, that every high priest is taken from amongst men to offer and appointed unto the things of God, to offer sacrifice for the people. And so he will say to them, as he hands to them the chalice and paten, receive the power to offer sacrifice to God and to celebrate Mass both for the living and in the dead. In the name of the Lord, amen. Again, we've seen many times and heard throughout this ceremony of how the priest is, receives the sacred orders from the bishop of the second order as a helper of the bishop. And there we see a witness to the very nature of the church, that the priest can only teach, govern, and sanctify as an extension of the bishop. It is the bishop who has jurisdiction by his apostolic office, which he receives from the keys of St. Peter. So we see that any priest attempting to an independent ministry would contradict the very nature of the Catholic religion, as it is uh, as those notes of apostolic that is being sent, and likewise that of being one and always in communion with the one holy Catholic Church. This is, of course, the tradition of the Church and the ancient faith expressed by St. Ignatius of Antioch, the third successor to St. Peter in that see, who said already in the early second century, see that you all follow the bishop even as Jesus Christ does the Father and the presbytery as you would the apostles and reverence the deacons as being the institution of God. Let no man do anything connected with the church without the bishop. Let that be deemed a proper Eucharist which is administered either by the bishop or by one to whom he has entrusted it. Wherever the bishop shall appear, there let the multitude of the people also be even as wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. 
It is not lawful without the bishop either to baptize or to celebrate, but whatsoever he shall approve of, that is also pleasing to God, so that everything that is done may be secure and valid. He who does anything without the knowledge of the bishop does, in reality, serve the devil. have now washed their hands and folded up their manaturgia and placed them on the side and they now go back to their places but they do not return to the pews from whence they came but rather they stay in the sanctuary for the remainder of the mass because they are now going to offer the rest of this mass in union with the bishop. to their pews with the lighted candle with which they entered, symbolizing, of course, their grace in their souls and faith. A Bavarian confrere told me that he had kept the, his family had kept the candle that he received in his baptism, which he subsequently used as he presented himself for his first Holy Communion, his tonsure, and then his ordination to the priesthood reminder to Catholic parents that vocations of the priesthood come from holy families and from those promises that parents and godparents make to raise their children in the Catholic faith and holiness from the very beginning of their Christian lives.
moment, the scola will continue the Alleluia antiphon, which from the Feast of St. Bede the Venerable is the following. The Lord loved him and decorated him. He hath clothed him in a stole of glory. The just man shall flourish like the lily and will bear fruit in eternity before the Lord. Alleluia. Again, Alleluia, meaning praise to our Lord. And this announces, of course, that the good news has come. Our Lord will now speak to us in the Holy Gospel. We see now the deacon uh, taking the book of the Gospels, who will go to the bishop. Durandus comments that the subdeacon goes to the celebrant and pays reverence to him after his reading. But the deacon does this before, because the law reached its end in Christ, but the Gospel took its origin from him. And he seeks a blessing, according to the word of the Apostle. How shall they preach unless they be sent? Once again, we see clearly in all these ceremonies today that a priest's power to teach, govern, and sanctify comes from the bishop, must always be exercised in union with the bishop. We will also see that he will then face north. Consider the ancient practice of the church to celebrate the mass towards the east, from whence the sun rises, symbolizing the sun of justice, Christ, the light of the world. As the mass is celebrated towards the east, the gospel is preached towards the north. This is from very ancient times as well. North, uh, for the Romans, of course, was a, a land of greater darkness, cold, and from whence they were often attacked by pagan barbarians. And so it signifies that the light of the gospel must be preached to those cold and dark places. We see too in this beautiful pontifical mass that there are two focal points in the liturgy. Half of the liturgy centers around the altar and half of the liturgy centers around the bishop upon his throne. And this is directly from the book of Apocalypse where we see the lamb seated upon his throne, but also the lamb who is slain upon the altar of God. St. Augustine bids us, let us therefore hear the gospel just as if we were listening to the Lord himself present. The continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is good for nothing any more but to be cast out and to be trodden on by men. You are the light of the world. A city seated on a mountain cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but upon a candlestick, that it may shine to all that are in the house. So let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. For amen I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle sh shall pass of the law till it all be fulfilled. He therefore that shall break one of these least commandments and shall so teach men shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But he that shall do and teach, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven.
parents will look to the subdeacon of the camera to show that the latter has now been instructed, and the subdeacon signifying the old law of the synagogue. They return in procession to the giver of sanctity, the bishop, to show that all good things must be referred to God. When the giver of sanctity kisses the book, that he may say with the apostle, I am delighted with the law of God according to the inward man. now recites the offertory antiphon the just shall flourish like the palm tree he shall grow up like the cedar of libanus alleluia St. Thomas Aquinas comments on the offertory that now that the people have been prepared and instructed, the celebration of the mystery begins. This mystery is offered as a sacrifice and consecrated and received as a sacrament. So first comes an oblation, then the consecration of what has been offered, then the reception of this in Holy Communion. The oblation consists in two things, the people's praise and the offertory chant, which we hear the scola singing right now, which expresses the joy of those who offer and the prayer of the priest who asks that the people's oblation may be accepted by God. And so David says, I also, in the simplicity of my heart, have joyfully offered all these things, and I have seen with great joy thy people, which are here present, offer thee their offerings. And then he prays, Lord, keep, Lord God, keep this will. And now see the newly ordained priests come and offer their candles symbol of the offering of their life now to our Lord.
The priests have now taken their place within the sanctuary where they will, together with the bishop, offer the holy sacrifice of the Mass. They have by their side an assistant priest who will help instruct them and guide them through the Missal. As they are about to offer sacrifice, we see our Lord say this to the Apostles after he instituted the most blessed sacrament. He adds, Do this in commemoration of me thus transmitting them to the power to fulfill that command by offering the perpetual sacrifice of the Mass. One will note as peculiar to the traditional Roman rite, the language of sacrifice in the offertory. As we refer St. Alphonsus comments that in offering the bread and wine, the priest calls them the immaculate host, that is victim, the chalice of salvation. He says we should not be astonished at this for all the prayers and all the ceremonies before and after the consecration have reference to the divine victim. It is at the moment of consecration that the divine victim presents himself to God, that he offers himself to him, and that the sacrifice is offered. But as these different acts cannot be explained at the same time, they are explained one after the other. And they thus form the priest and the people in that intention to offer the one sacrifice pleasing to God, that of the body and blood of his divine Son. We also see that the bishop offers the host on the gold plate, which is called the paten. We will see in a moment that the subdeacon will take that paten and hide it. What does this symbolize? The great liturgical commentator Duranda says that the paten receives its name from the word patio, to be wide open. For this reason, it denotes a wide and generous heart. The sacrifice must be offered upon this patent, that is, with the breath of charity. And because his generous charity failed the apostles when they all forsook their master and fled, the priest conceals the patent when he has made the offering, placing it beneath the corporal, or else, as in this case of the pontifical mass, it is veiled by the subdeacon and taken from the altar. Deus qui humani substantiae dignitate mirabiliter condidisti et mirabilius reformati dan obis perhuius aque et vini mysterium eus divinitatis esse consortes it is a joy to watch these priests, these seven newly ordained priests, join the bishop in their first offertory as, as priests. Bishop Fulton Sheen often said that the priest is not his own, and he makes an offering of his life. And so now we watch these young men, these young priests, offer themselves with the host, with the patent, with the chalice, and with the bishop for the very first time, and they offer themselves and their lives as newly ordained priests. In spirito humilitatis ed in animo contrito suscipiamo a te, Domine, et sic fiat sacrificium nostrum in cospecto tuo hodie ut placia tibi, Domine Deus. And thus the Sullivan prays, bowing down before the altar, in the words of Daniel the prophet, in a spirit of humility and in a contrite mind, let us be received by thee, O Lord. And let our sacrifice be made such in thy sight this day that it may please thee, O Lord God. This again symbolizing that what we present, and the people too, by contributing to the offertory collection, representing that which is the, the means by which we buy the bread and wine, that we make the sacrifice possible. Again, you're offering the substance of your very self to our Lord, that it be transformed into his mystical body. Et in odorum suavitatis accipere per Christum Dominum nostrum. Mm. 
We see here in the operatory a beautiful testimony to the universality of this holy sacrifice of the Mass. These seven men who have been ordained come from all walks of life. They all have different backgrounds, different educations, and yet each and every one of them are saying the exact same words and offering the exact same sacrifice in union with Christ. And each of them, through the various difficulties that they have overcome in life, and the various paths that they have come to the seminary, they have come through the seminary, through all of those paths, all of those paths have led them here to the foot of the cross in Calvary, but also to offer sacrifice as a priest. In the incensing of the altar, the priest prays, May the Lord, by the intercession of blessed Michael the Archangel, standing at the right hand of the altar of incense, and of all his elect, vouchsafe to bless this incense and receive it as an odor of sweetness through Christ our Lord. Thus reminding us of the scene of the apocalypse that the Mass makes present for us, this heavenly liturgy, in which we see the angel offering incense before the throne of God, before the throne of the Lamb. St. Albert comments that now he turns to the people, asking them to support him by their prayer in the unity of the Church, saying, Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable before God, Father Almighty. Even though he holds the place of the giver of sanctity, he seeks the help of prayer to show the truth of the Apostle's words. He himself also is compassed with infirmity, and the infirm man needs the help of the Church. For St. James says, pray for one another that you may be saved. So we are reminded especially to pray for our priests in this moment. And then likewise, what they offer physically in their hands, Amen. we offer spiritually, hence the words that my sacrifice and yours. So we are to unite as members of the mystical body of Christ in offering the holy sacrifice of the Mass, in which we are also offered, as the Church teaches us. Tom Garanger likewise notes that these words form the priest's farewell to the people, for he will not again turn to them until the sacrifice be achieved. Reminds us of our Lord has his, fix, his face now fixed to go to Jerusalem to the place of sacrifice. Thus he will say the Dominus Fabiscum of the preface facing the cross. Tuis quesumus Domine 
operatore mysteriis, ut hic tibi munera dig dignis mentibus of operamus per Dominum nostrum Jesum Christum filium tuum, qui tecum vivere regnat in unitate Spiritus Sancti Deus, Per omnia secula seculorum. Amen. Dominus vobiscum. Et usiritum corda. Don Garanche comments that this dialogue is as old as the Church herself, this preface dialogue. And there is every reason to believe that the Apostles themselves arranged it, because it is to be found in the most ancient churches and in all liturgies. As he bids us to lift our hearts on high, St. Cyprian comments, When we stand praying, beloved brethren, we ought to be watchful and earnest with our whole hearts intent on our prayers. Let all carnal and worldly thoughts pass away, nor let the soul at that time think on anything but the object only of its prayer. The bishop stands at the altar with his hands held slightly apart, but in an open position, in a position that's called the oron's position. This signifies that he is gathering in the prayers of the faithful and offering them to our Lord uh, through this preface and through his ministry at the altar. of Rome comments on the Sanctus. The scripture says 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him, and thousands of thousands ministered to him, and they cried, Holy, 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 Lord of hosts. The whole creation is full of his glory. We too, therefore, gathering together in one accord in our conscience, should cry out earnestly as with one voice to him. Calling to mind that in every Holy Mass we are accompanied by a myriad of angels. The bishop now begins the ancient canon of the Mass. St. Robert Bellarmine comments that the first to give to the Roman Church a form of celebrating the sacrifice was undoubtedly St. Peter, who added to the words of our Lord certain prayers and rites. After him, various pontiffs added various prayers until the time of Pope Gregory, who was the last to add anything to the canon. Quam 
sotto orbe terrarum una cum famoro tuo Papa nostro Francisco e digni servo tuo ed in Pisite nostro Iacobo ed omnibus ortodoxis acque catholice ed apostolice fide cultoribus. Memento Domine famorum famorumque tuarum. Et omnium circumstantium, quorum tibi fide cognita est et nota devotio, pro quibus tibi offerimus, vel qui tibi offerunt hoc sacrificium laudis, pro spesi visque omnibus, pro redemptione animarum tuarum, pro spes salutis et incolumnitate sue, tibique redunt vota sua eterno Deo vivo et vero. Comunicantes et memoriam venerantes in primis gloriose semper virginis Mariae, genitricis Dei et Domini nostri Iesu Christi, sed et beati Iosef e iustem virginis sponsi et beatorum apostolorum ac martyrum tuorum, Petri et Pauli, Andrei, Iacobi, Ioannis, Tome, Iacobi, Filippi, Bartolomei, Matei, Simoni, Setadei, Lini, Pleti, Clementi, Sixti, Cornelii, Cipriani, Laurentii, Crisogoni, Ioannis et Pauli, Cosme et Damiani, et omnium sanctorum tuorum, quorum meritis precebusque concedas, ud in omnibus protectiones tue muniamur auxilio per iundem Christum Dominum nostrum. Amen. And while the, can, the canon of the Mass is very set and very ancient and has been given to us by the patrimony of the Church, nevertheless there are two instances in the Mass where the priest can insert the names of those for whom he prays. One is before the consecration, in the memento of the living, and one is after the consecration, in the memento of the prayers for the dead. We see here the bishop extend his hands over the chalice in the patent in the form of a cross. This ancient symbol was, this ancient rubric was performed over the sacrificial victim called the scapegoat. The scapegoat in the Old Testament was a, an animal that, was, that would take the blame, take the punishment of sins and take it out of the city of Jerusalem there to be done away with. Here, so too, here in the New Testament, Christ has been our scapegoat for sins and by the sacrifice of the cross. Simili modo postquam senatum est, ac cipiem secunt precarum calicem in sanctas ac venerabilis manus suas, item tibi gratias agens, benedictit, dedique discipulis sui vicem, ac cipite et bibite ex eo omnes. Hic est.
Unde et memores domine no servi tui sed et plebs tua sancta e justem Christi fili tui domini nostri tam beate passionis nec non et ab interis resurrectionis sed et in celos gloriosi ascensionis offerimus plecare maestati tue di tuis donis ac datis hostiam puram hostiam sanctam Hostiam Immaculatam, Panem Sanctum Vite Eterne, et Calicem Salutis Perpetue. Supra que propitio ac sereno vulto respicere digneris, et accepta habere sicuti, accepta habere dignatus est munera puri tui justi abel, et sacrificium patriarche nostri abrahe, et quod tibi optulit sumus sacerdus tuus Melchizedek, Sanctum Sacrificium Immaculatam Hostiam. Supplices te rogamus, omnipotens Deus, iubi hec perferi per manus sancti angeli tui, in sublime altari tuum, in conspectu divine maestatis tue, ut quot quot ex hac altaris participazione, sacro sanctum filii tui, corpus et sanguinem sum serimus, Omni benedictione celesti et gratia repleamur pe iundem Christum Dominum nostrum. Amen. Memento etiam, Domine, famulorum, famularumque tuarum, qui nos preceserunt cum signo fidei et dormiunt in somno pacis. And Robert Bellarmine comments that this offer is offering that follows the consecration is the whole church bearing witness that she consents to the offering made by Christ and offers it along with him. Dom Garanger, Garanger says, she steps forward as the bride in the presence of the glorious Trinity and says, I am endowed with thine own riches. I possess him as mine own, who has performed all this that I am now calling to mind. He is mine, for thou hast given him to me. Behold, I offer him unto thee, and this my offering is worthy of thee. Benedicis et Christas nobis. Per ipsum et cum ipso et in ipso, est tibi Deo Patri omnipotenti in unitate Spiritus Sancti, omnis honor et gloria. Per omnia secula seculorum. St. Peter Damien says, because Jesus crying with a loud voice yielded up the ghost, the priest lifts his voice saying, per omnia secula seculorum, because the women bewailed and lamented him. The choir answers amen, and because a great stone was rolled at the door of the tomb, the deacon covers the chalice once more with the pall. Sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum. He continues, it is Jesus cried with a loud voice, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And so the priest lifts up his voice and says, Our Father who art in heaven. Anem nostrum quotidianum da nobis hodie, et imite nobis debita nostra, sicud et nos dimitimus, debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem. Amen.
libera nos quesumus domine ab omnibus malis preteritis presentibus et futuris, ed intercedente beata, gloriosa, semper virgine Dei genitrice Maria, cum beatis apostolis tuis Petro et Paolo, atque Andrea, St. Peter Damien comments on this prayer the bishop is saying now that the silence that follows the Our Father represents the peace of our Lord's tomb. For on the Saturday, Christ rested in the tomb according to the flesh. This prayer is called the embolism and it expounds the final petition of the Our Father. Periundem Dominum Nostrum Jesum Christum, qui tecum vivet et regnat in unitate Spiritus Sancti Deus, per omnia secula seculorum. Pax Domini, sit semper vobiscum. St. Thomas Aquinas comments that the resurrection on the third day is represented by the three crosses that are made at the words, May the peace of our Lord be always with you. His body and blood being now joined back together in, under the sacred species. At this point in the Mass, there is a great emphasis on peace, especially the peace that Christ gives us. We have the words that the bishop is saying now over the chalice, Pax Domini sit semper vobiscum, or the peace of the Lord be with you always. Soon after that, he says the Agnus Dei, the final petition of which is, Lord, grant us peace. And the very first prayer that follows the Agnus Dei is the priest's personal prayer for peace and peace of soul. And now we see the bishop extending the sign of peace to the priests who will come up one by one to the altar. All the priests who are ordained will receive the pox, receive this peace directly from the bishop's hands. And another minister will take that pox, the peace of the bishop, and bring it to all of the clergy, all of the tonsured clergy who are here in this church today. This great emphasis on peace shows that the death of Christ is what brings us peace. The sacrifice of Calvary brings us the peace, and the peace that only Christ can give is what the bishop offers symbolically to each and every one of the clergy here today. St. Alphonsus remarks that before giving the peace, the priest kisses the altar to show that he cannot give peace unless he has first received it from Jesus Christ, who is represented by the altar. Thus we see in this ancient practice of how the peace flows from our Eucharistic Lord on the cross of his, uh, the altar of his cross and flows down as it transmitted from the priest to the people. And as each of the newly ordained priests comes up, the, be the priest, or the bishop, rather, says to him, Peace be with you. And these are the words that Christ says to his apostles, or the very first words of Christ after the resurrection. Peace be to you. Domine Jesu Christe, Filii Dei 
vivi, qui è volontà che Padre, è volontà che Spirito Santo, che morte in tua mondo vivificati. Liberami per questa che tanto forte si espande in te a ogni definizione di noi per l'universo umano, per far noi tuoi sempre onorevoli mandati, che da te non può separare per mica, chi come ora in Dio Padre, e Spirito Santo vivi per regna Dei in tuoi colonne e colore. Amen. Se accetti il corpo di Sui, Domine, Gesù Cristo, con ego indigno sumere il presumo, non nini proveni ad indigizio e condannazione, se pro sua pietà ti croci vivi, attitamente menti per corpi, per addedere un po' di pienda, chi vivi per regna con Dio Padre, in unità di Spirito Santo di Dio, per ogni secolo e colore. Amen. Panem Celestem Accipiam et Nomen Domini Invocabo. Domini Nostrum Digno, Serum Tet Tetetum Meum, Petatum Vit Verbo et Conavite Anima Meum. Domini Nostrum Digno, Serum Tet Tetetum Meum, Petatum Vit Verbo et Conavite Anima Meum. Domini Nostrum Digno, Serum Tet Tetetum Meum, Petatum Vit Verbo et Conavite Anima Meum. Corpus Domini Nostrum Jesu Christi Custodium Anima Meum, And we note that when the celebrant, as well as the people, receive Holy Communion, the sign of the cross is made over them with the sacred victim, reminding us that we must be conformed to him, that we must die to ourselves in order to rise again with Christ. Dom Guéranger reminds us with what devotion we ought to receive every Holy Communion. For he says, the priest says, May the body of our Lord Jesus Christ keep my soul unto life everlasting. The priest will say this as he distributes Holy Communion to each of the faithful. And he says, he speaks as if he were to communicate, but once only in his life. One communion would be of itself be sufficient to preserve our soul unto life eternal. For such is the intrinsic efficacy of this divine sacrament provided for our wants by God. It's often written in the sacristy, a phrase for the priest to recollect himself before Mass, that he is to offer this Mass as if it were his first Mass, his last Mass, and his only Mass. So we too should receive each Holy Communion as if it were our first, our last, and our only Holy Communion. Now we will see the bishop and assistant priests distribute Holy Communion. St. Thomas Aquinas comments, There are three reasons why it is for the priest to distribute Holy Communion. First, he consecrates in the person of Christ. And just as Christ consecrated his own body at the supper, so also he gave it to others to receive. Secondly, the priest has been set up as a mediator between God and the people. So just as it is for him to offer the people's gifts to God, so it is for him to give the divinely hallowed gifts to the people. Thirdly, because from reverence for this sacrament, it is touched only by what has been consecrated. So just as the corporal and the chalice are consecrated, so are the hands of the priest. 
wonderful reality we've seen illustrated so beautifully and clearly in these traditional ceremonies. Omnibus sanctis et sibi pater, qui ape cavinimis cogitatione verbo et opere, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima. Regarding those beautiful ceremonies, the deacon now sings a confidior and professes unworthiness on behalf of the people before they receive the Lamb of God. And the beauty of all these ceremonies we are witnessing, as the fathers of the church tell us, it's the law of prayer expressed through our ceremonies, which establishes a law of belief. St. John Fisher said, take away ceremonies from the church and you will straight away destroy the worship of God among the greater part of Christians. Make sure that no one raises his hands or bends his knee or strikes his breast or bares his head uh, to pray or stands to hear the gospel re read or does any similar thing and you will see that within a few days what we call devotion fades quite away. For the devotion which remains in the hearts of a few Christians feeble spark of worship, though it may be, is kept alive by ceremonies. before distributing communion says the words Ece Agnus Dei, Behold the Lamb of God. These are the words taken from St. John the Baptist who uttered them in a cry of joy and recognition and in, and in hope when he recognized our Lord coming to be baptized by him in the River Jordan. So too, Holy Mother Church puts these words on the lips of her children as they recognize our Lord in Holy Communion and go forth in joy to receive him. St. Thomas Aquinas asks the question, which is the greatest of the sacraments? And as 
Classically, as a theologian, he gives three answers. He says, if we consider which sacrament is the most necessary, then baptism is the greatest of the sacraments because baptism is necessary for salvation. He says, in, in effect of, in consideration of what the sacrament symbolizes, then marriage is the greatest of the sacraments because marriage symbolizes the deep, intimate union between Christ and his church. But if we consider the sacraments in themselves, which sacrament is the greatest in itself? It is Holy Communion. And the blessed Eucharist that Christ has given us, Eucharist meaning thanksgiving. And thanksgiving is the fundamental disposition that the Christian people have with regards to the Eucharist, with regards to Holy Communion. We are thankful and from the bottom of our hearts to be able to receive our Lord in Holy Communion. Those watching this on transmission who cannot receive our Lord's sacramentally, we call to mind the words of the Council of Trent, which says, Some receive this holy sacrament only spiritually, namely those who eat this heavenly bread by desire, and with the living faith that worketh through love. And these receive its fruit and benefit. And one can pray with St. Alphonsus, My Jesus, I believe that thou art present in the blessed sacrament. I love thee above all things, and I desire thee in my soul. Since I cannot now receive thee sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. As though thou wert already here, I embrace thee and unite myself wholly to thee. Permit not that I should ever be separated from thee. Amen. Antiphon, being sung so beautifully by the Skola, is, is the following, the faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord setteth over his family, to give them their measure of wheat in due season. Alleluia. All these beautiful propers on the Feast of St. Bede, being a wonderful commentary on the priesthood which has been conferred on these seven men today. We see likewise the love and devotion of all our faithful who have come not only from the local area but from all over the country to be present today, showing their great support uh, for our priestly fraternity of St. Peter, so grateful that our work continues at the service of the Church for the salvation of their souls. On behalf of all the priests, we thank you immensely for all of your prayers. We as priests uh, depend on your prayers and your support. We note that there are not only the church is filled with people today, but also the very large vestibule. We estimate there are over 700 or 800 people present today. A great day of rejoicing for Holy Mother Church and for our priests of eternity in particular. There you'll see in the background too, our provincial superior, Father William Lawrence. We ask that all pray for him as well, especially as he, as he guides our province throughout the North America.
And after the reception of Holy Communion, we cannot forget the great duty we have of giving thanks to God. In fact, the name which he chose for this sacrament, biblically of Eucharist, giving thanks, that is, signifying giving thanks, is to remind us that this is how we fulfill this great duty we have towards God. We'll call to mind the messages of our Lord's apparition, messages of the Sacred Heart. Behold the heart which has so loved mankind, but which by the majority has re receives nothing but ingratitude and indifference. Let us never cease to give him thanks. Blessed Hyacinth comments that the communion and the post-communion are the start of our thanksgiving. This means giving to God something in exchange for what he has given us. To give to him the Eucharist of our lives by our, our daily actions in return for the Eucharist that we have received at the altar of the Most High. As part of the church's patrimony, we have inherited the beautiful prayer after communion of St. Thomas Aquinas. I give thee thanks, O Holy Lord, Father Almighty, eternal God, who has deigned not through any merits of mine own, but solely out of the condescension of your goodness, to satisfy me, a sinner, your unworthy servant, with the precious body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that this Holy Communion be not a condemnation unto punishment, but a saving plea unto forgiveness. May it be unto me the armor of faith and the shield of goodwill. May it be the emptying out of my vices and the extinction of all lustful desires. May it be the increase of charity and patience, of humility and obedience, and of all virtues. A strong defense against the snares of all enemies both visible and invisible. May it be the perfect quieting of all my evil impulses of flesh and spirit, binding me firmly to you, the one true God, and may it be a pledge of a blessed eternal destiny. I pray too that thou, O Lord, will deign to bring me a sinner to that ineffable banquet where you, with your Son and the Holy Spirit, are to your saints true light, fullness of content, eternal joy, unalloyed gladness and perfect bliss for the same Christ our Lord. Amen.
Now that communion is over, the bishop will pray the prayer Yam Non Dikam. This is taken from our Lord's words to his apostles at the Last Supper when he ordained his own apostles, priests. He said, I no longer call you servants, but friends. These are the words that now the bishop says in the place of Christ, in persona Christi, in the person of Christ. He says these words to the newly ordained priest. No longer will I call you servants, but my friends, because you have known all things. I have wrought in the midst of you. Alleluia. Receive the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, within you. He it is whom the Father will send to you. Alleluia. You are my friends if you do the things that I command you. Receive the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, within you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. He it is whom the Father will send to you. Alleluia.
The priests have just recited the Apostles' Creed before the bishop, again professing their loyalty to the faith once transmitted to the church for all time. And we will hand on what we have received, as the Apostle himself proclaims, that even if an angel from heaven should preach a gospel different than that which we have received from the Apostles, let him be anathema. So they profess their fidelity to the Catholic faith. And now we see that he, uh, the chasuble, which again symbolizes the, which means the little house, symbolizing thus the house of God, the mystical body of Christ, which we saw during the consecration was lifted up as well, reminding us that we not only offer spiritually the sacrifice of the mass, but are offered together with Christ. That the whole body of Christ is offered together with Christ the head. And now the priest then, hearing the words from the bishop now, saying, receive the Holy Ghost, whose sins thou shalt forgive, they are forgiven them, and whose sins thou shalt retain, they are retained. They now receive uh, the authority to extend that forgiveness over the members of the mystical body of Christ through the sacrament of penance. And unfolding the chasuble, he says, the Lord clothe thee with the robe of innocence. The priest now joins his hands and places them between those of the bishop. The bishop asks him, Dost thou promise to thy prelate by ordinary reverence and obedience? And the priest answers, I promise. Once again, the priest can only teach, govern, sanctify, forgive sins, and offering a, offer a Eucharist pleasing to God if he is in union with the bishop. with that promise of obedience. The bishop then responds to him, the peace of the Lord be with, ever with you. Peace being the tranquility of order, which is preserved by this hierarchical structure. One is reminded of the words that we pray on Holy Thursday night. Christ was made obedient unto death, even to the death of the cross. And therefore, that is because of that obedience, God hath exalted him and given him a name that is above all names.
The bishop now addresses them, saying, Dearly beloved sons, as that which you will now have to do is not free from risk, I warn you that before you attempt to celebrate the Mass, you diligently learn from experienced priests the ceremonies of the whole Mass and all that regards the consecration and breaking of the host and the communion. Now he will bless them, saying, May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost descend upon you, that you may be blessed in the priestly order and may offer propitiatory sacrifices for the sins and offenses of the people to Almighty God, to whom belongs glory and honor, world without end. Amen. Nobis Domine, tua sacrificia dent salutem beatus So that your sacrificial rites may grant us salvation, we pray you, O Lord, that blessed Bede, your bishop and illustrious doctor, may draw nigh as our intercessor. He adds a prayer for the ordinati. Mercifully, O Lord, lift up by thy abiding help those whom thou dost refresh by thy sacraments, so that we may receive the fruit of thy redemption both in these mysteries and in the conduct of our lives. Who livest and reignest in union with the Holy Ghost, world without end. Amen. meaning go thou art sent reminding the priests that they are now sent out for the sanctification of the world and all of us as well St. Antoninus comments Ite Misa Est which is understood go to your own homes for the mass is done or the victim has been offered to God for the human race or go follow Christ and do not mope in the world Church says, according to Saint Amalarius, Deo gratias, thanks be to God, according to the apostolic example. For when the apostles had adored Jesus, they quote, went back into Jerusalem with great joy. Et omnibus proquibus illud optoli sit te miserante propitiabile per Christum Dominum nostrum. Amen. Sit nomin Domini Benedictum. Agitorium nostrum in nomine Domini. Benedicat vos omnipotens Deus. Pater et Filio et Spiritus Sancto. Amen.
Amanda says this last blessing over the people represents the sending of the Holy Spirit, whom our Lord sent upon the apostles after he had ascended into heaven. He now addresses the newly ordained. Dearly beloved sons, consider attentively the order you have taken and the burden laid on your shoulders. Endeavor to lead a holy and godly life and to please Almighty God that you may obtain his grace, which may he of his mercy be pleased to grant you. You that have been ordained priests, after your first mass shall say three other masses, namely one of the Holy Ghost, the second of the Blessed Mary, ever virgin, and a third for the faithful departed, and pray also to Almighty God for me. To which the priests respond, Levento, gladly. Now recites the last gospel, that is the prologue of St. John, which sums up the whole mystery of redemption, made present in the sacrifice of the Mass, of how in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. St. Augustine comments that the beginning of this gospel ought to be inscribed in letters of gold and set up in the most prominent place in every church, as it is fittingly recited at the end of Mass as, our, as our expressing our thanksgiving to God, to which we respond, Deo gratias. the hymn Te Deum Laudamus, the great hymn of thanksgiving, in which we pray. We praise thee, O God. We acknowledge thee to be the Lord. All the earth doth worship thee, the Father everlasting. To thee all the angels cry aloud, the heavens and all the powers therein. To thee the cherubim and seraphim continually do cry, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts. Heaven and earth are full of the majesty of thy glory. The glorious choir of the apostles praise thee. The admirable company of the prophets praise thee. The white-robed army of martyrs praise thee. The holy church throughout the world doth acknowledge thee, the Father of infinite majesty. Thine adorable, true, and only Son, and the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. Thou art the King of glory, O Christ. Thou art the everlasting Son of the Father. Thou, when thou wouldst take human nature to deliver man, didst not disdain the virgin's womb. When thou hast overcome the sting of death, 
Thou didst open to believers the kingdom of heaven. Thou sittest at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. We believe that thou shalt come to be our judge. We beseech thee, therefore, help thy servants, whom thou hast redeemed with thy precious blood. Make them to be numbered with thy saints in glory everlasting. O Lord, save thy people and bless thine inheritance. Govern them and exalt them forever. Day by day we bless thee, and we praise thy name forever, yea, forever and ever. Vouchsafe, O Lord, this day to keep us without sin. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Let thy mercy be upon us, O Lord, as we have hoped in thee. O Lord, in thee have I hoped. Let me not be kept and founded forever. Once more, we express our utmost thanks to His Excellency, the Most Reverend Thomas Gullickson, Titch Archbishop of Polymartium, who came to confer the Holy Priesthood on these seven newly ordained priests of the priestly fraternity of St. Peter. We congratulate them and their families who have come from afar. And once again, Father Sidrian Cortez, with family present from his native land of Mililani, Hawaii, Likewise, Father Noel Suarez, family likewise present all the way from Goa, India. 
to Father David Lopez, a family and faithful present from San Diego, California, to Fathers David and Edgar Ramirez, brothers again ordained today with faithful and family attending from El Paso, Texas, to Father Kent, Kent Greeley from Victoria, British Columbia, people coming likewise from Canada for this event, and lastly to Father Isaac Diaz Mendoza from Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico, with his parents and faithful presence today. So a truly international event, a great joy for our whole fraternity and for the whole church. We ask all to pray every day, to offer up a prayer, a Hail Mary, one of your Hail Marys every day for these newly ordained priests, that they might be priests according to the heart of Christ.